the first objects that assume a distinct presence before me as I look far back into the blank of my infancy are my mother with her pretty hair and youthful shape and my nurse with no shape at all and eyes so dark that they seem to darken their whole neighborhood in her face. I believe I can remember these two at a little distance apart dwarfed to my sight by stooping down or kneeling on the floor, and I going unsteadily from one to the other. I have an impression on my mind, which I cannot distinguish from actual remembrance, of the touch of my nurse's forefinger, as she used to hold it out to me, and of it being roughened by needlework, like a pocket nutmeg grater. This may be fancy, though I think the memory of most of us can go further back into such times than many of us suppose, just as I believe the power of observation in numbers of very young children to be quite wonderful for its closeness and accuracy. Indeed, I think that most grown men who are remarkable in this respect may with greater propriety be said not to have lost the faculty than to have acquired it the rather, as I generally observe, such men to retain a certain freshness and gentleness and capacity of being pleased, which are also an inheritance they have preserved from their childhood. I might have a misgiving that I am meandering in stopping to say this, but that it brings me to remark that I build these conclusions in part upon my own experience of myself and if it should appear from anything I may set down in this narrative, that I was a child of close observation, or that as a man I have a strong memory of my childhood, I undoubtedly lay claim to both of those characteristics. Looking back, as I was saying, into the blank of my infancy, I recall that somebody, who, I wonder, in which way did she go when she died, hummed the evening hymn to me, and I cried on the pillow, either with the remorseful consciousness of having kicked somebody else, or because still somebody else had hurt my feelings in the course of the day. I can faintly remember learning the alphabet at my mother's knee. To this day, when I look upon the fat black letters in the primer, and the puzzling novelty of their shapes, and the easy good nature of O and Q and S, seem to present themselves again before me as they used to do. A was an archer, and shot at a frog. Of course he was. He was an apple pie also, and there he is. He was a good many things in his time, was A, and so were most of his friends, except X, who had so little versatility that I never knew him to get beyond Xerxes and Xantippe, like Y, who was always confined to a yacht, or a yew tree, and Z, condemned forever to be zebra or a zany. I remember my poor mother, God forgive her, putting me on a low wall with an iron railing on the top and making me cheer the Prince Regent who was driving by. What party can that have been? And what New Year's Day can that have been which first rooted in the phrase a New Year's Day party in my mind? So far back to my recollections of childhood extend, that I have a vivid remembrance of the sensation of being carried downstairs in a woman's arms and holding tight to her in the terror of seeing the steep perspective below. Hence I may have been carried into this party, for anything I know, but somehow or other I most certainly got there, and was in a doorway looking on, and in that look a New Year's party revealed itself to me. As a very long row of ladies and gentlemen sitting against a wall, all drinking at once, out of little glass cups with handles, like custard cups. What can this party have been? I am afraid it must have been a dull one, but I know it came off. Where can this party have been? I have not the faintest notion where, but I am absolutely certain it was somewhere. Why the company should have all been drinking at once, and especially why they should all have been drinking out of custard cups, are points of fact over which the waters of oblivion have long rolled. I doubt if they can have been drinking the old year out and the new one in, because they were not at supper and had no table before them. There was no speech-making, no quick movement and change of action, no demonstration of any kind. 
They were all sitting in a long row against the wall, very like my first idea of good people in heaven, as I derived it from the wretched picture in the prayer book. And they had all got their heads a little thrown back, and were all drinking at once. It is possible enough that I, the baby, may have been caught up out of bed to have a peep at the company, and that the company may happen to have been thus occupied for the flash and space of a moment only. But it has always seemed to me as if I looked at them for a long time, hours, during which they did nothing else, and to this present time a casual mention in my hearing of a party on New Year's Day always revives that picture. On what other early New Year's Day can I possibly have been an innocent accomplice in the secreting, in a coal cellar too, of a man with a wooden leg? There was no man with a wooden leg in the circle of my acknowledged and lawful relations and friends. Yet, I clearly remember that we stealthily conducted the man with the wooden leg, whom we knew intimately, into the coal cellar, and that, in getting him over the coals to hide him behind some partition, there was beyond, his wooden leg bored itself in among the coals, and his hat flew off, and he fell backwards and lay prone, a spectacle of helplessness. I clearly remember that his struggles to get up among the small coals and to obtain any purchase on himself in those slippery and shifting circumstances were a work of exceeding difficulty, involving delay and noise that occasioned us excessive terrors. I have not the least idea who we were, except that I had a little sister for another innocent accomplice, and that there must have been a servant girl for principal. Neither do I know whether the man with the wooden leg robbed the house before or afterwards, or otherwise nefariously distinguished himself, nor how a cat came to be connected with the occasion, and had a fit, and ran over the top of the door. But I know that some awful reason compelled us to hush it all up, and that we were never told. For many years I had this association with New Year's Day entirely to myself, until at last the anniversary being come round again, I said to my little sister, as she and I sat by chance among our children, Do you remember the New Year's Day of the man with the wooden leg? Whereupon a thick black curtain, which had overhung him from her infancy, went up, and she saw just this much of the man, and not a jot more. A day or so before her death, that little sister told me that, in the night, the smell of the fallen leaves in the woods, where we had habitually walked as very young children, had come upon her with such strength of reality that she had moved her head to look for strewn leaves on the floor of her bedside. What else do I remember? Let me see.